making making the argument that uh, that it's not sufficient to just synthesize biology. You have to read, write, and test it. Um, and and uh, this is my these are groups that have helped me get things going in the conflict of interest in the lower right. Um, uh, what we have is uh, exponential, which is at times uh, even faster than the amazing exponential of electronics, uh, with, where we've seen a poor quality uh, non-clinical genome go for $3 billion, um, now dropping in a few years to uh, $300, now high quality clinical grade genome. Um, uh, the first th less than $1,000 was in 2016. And most of this is due to multiplexing. And we'll talk about multiplexing a little bit along the way. Um, one, there's this intimate dance between reading and writing. Uh, you can use synthetic biology to make better reading tools. And I'll, I'll give a couple of quick examples here. One is the, the fusion of a helicase or polymerase with a, with a, with a pore, a toxin pore that goes through a bilayer. Um, this, this produced uh, nanopores, which was a crazy idea in the mid 1980s when, when I first suggested it, but it's now uh, one of the best ways of getting long reads in DNA sequencing. And uh, Roche actually acquired two companies that are related to, the, to potentially related to nanopore, Genia and Stratos. Um, and we co authored a couple of papers with Genia just prior to that. Um, Oxford Nanopore as well. And then the latest one that just announced uh, on the 15th of November, the 50th anniversary of the 404, 404 chip uh, is Roswell. And Roswell is the first really molecular transistor and molecular electronics, um, which doesn't require a pore. It just is, um, gate, is acting as a gate in a, in a transistor. Um, and it's amazing how this thing self-assemble um, um, in, in a large scale integrated circuit. Um, another point to celebrate in this uh, exponential curve is not just reading, writing DNA, but also uh, therapies. Uh, here we have uh, what is for all in the world uh, a, a, a gene therapy, either lipid nanoparticles or adenovirus with either RNA or sing single strand RNA or double strand DNA, now as low as $4 a dose down from $2.5 million a dose, uh, not quite comparing apples to apples because the Zolgensma is for a rare disease while the, the vaccine is for a common one. But anyway, the point is $4 a dose is where we're getting for gene therapies, particular category. We've also published five papers recently on using machine learning for protein design. This is different from predicting protein structure. This, this actually, you can bypass protein structure and go to straight to function uh, using machine learning, uh, especially if augmented by mega libraries or multiplex libraries. Uh, so we sometimes call this MLML. Um, and uh, this, these five papers spun off three companies, uh, Manifold, Nabla, and Dino. Dino is uh, making viral capsules for gene delivery. So I think that's relevant to the previous slides. So I'll just give a couple more slides that amplify on that. that intersection of uh, machine learning, synthetic biology, viral capsids for gene delivery. So again, this is uh, multiplex libraries and machine learning. We used, we made uh, over a million different designs. So these are not random uh, mutations, these are designed capsids. And then we can go in and check for their compatibility the immune system and their, and their ability to, to tissue, to, go either tissue specific delivery or systemic delivery for multiple tissues intentionally. And this was published in two papers uh, recently by Pierce and Eric, uh, who were uh, graduate students or postdocs in our lab. And, and to prime the pump for this machine learning, we systematically made every possible amino acid substitution um, in the capsid protein. Um, and then look to see where it would home. So we're basically, it's a, the, a library of tissues against a library of viruses, um, making every possible amino acid substitution. So this is comprehensive for one mutation at a time, but we wanna take this, use this information to allow us to make combinations which would be astro astronomical 
to, to try to do uh, systematically. This we can do systematically, even though it's big, it's still finite, but uh, or it's within our range. Anyways, so this shows that red is where they're, they're extra good, better than wild type at, at tissue tropism going to these various tissues and blue means it's worse. And you can see a little bit of red in each of these experiments. Um, but this is where we can take that basic information of all the possible substitutions and what they, how they affect tissue tropism and immune reaction. And we can really pack them in at high density. So normally if you tried to mutagenize say a 28 uh, amino acid stretch, you'd get to about four in the, in the lower left here before you break the virus. So before you could make a, a more amazing virus, you're gonna break it at four if it's random. But if, if you use these um, convolutional recurrent neural nets uh, from machine learning, you can get almost complete substitute where you're substituting every single position uh, in that 28 amino acid stretch or any stretch of amino acids. So that's, that's real progress for protein design for function. Doesn't necessarily require, you know, the three-dimensional structure, although I love three-dimensional structure being a crystallographer by training. So now I'm gonna frame the rest of the talk in terms of, uh, with, with respect to um, a, a certain uh, elephant species. Um, but I'm gonna use that as a kind of a jumping off point to talk about uh, work that, that we've done that is of, of relevance to human health. Um, you can think of it either way as the, the, the human health project of helping us engineer the elephant or the engineer the elephant is going to have all kinds of spinoffs in human health. But we're going to talk about the, 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 the why and uh, how we're doing this. Um, and in particular, we're making technology, the why is we're making new technologies for endangered species. And a lot of these endangered species are of great importance for human uh, health and um, well being of our species. Um, anyway, we'll, we'll go through each of these and, and how we're doing it. Now, the, the elephant in the room is endangered. Uh, all species of elephant, not just one, is endangered. And um, also, what is at risk here uh, is that the uh, soil and the offshore um, of the Arctic has a remarkable amount of carbon, a lot of it in the form of methane, which is about 80 times worse than carbon dioxide in terms of global warming. And so, even if humans stopped uh, their nine gigaton per year uh, release, there still would be 1400 gigatons at risk, uh, which could happen uh, relatively quickly at the rate at which it seems to be going in a positive feedback loop. So we're looking at uh, a keystone species, the, the elephant or the mammoth, very, very closely related species, just um, not that different from you and me. Uh, our differences, uh, but the um, various uh, ecology uh, study groups, such as the Zemovs, have have uh, uh, offered evidence uh, and theory for what three ways in which such a keystone species would help with um, carbon sequestration, keeping it, uh, getting it in better, and keeping it in and hopefully extracting enough carbon dioxide out of the air that we can start aiming towards pre-industrial levels rather than just slowing down the, 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 the growth, the increase in carbon. So these three ways are uh, grass, the, 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 the pre, when the uh, mammoths were on the, in the Arctic, there was a, a lot, there was a grass system. There was an ecosystem based on um, lots of herbivores and grasses, which are better at photosynthesis they're better at reflecting the light that they don't use. And they uh, allow the packing of snow in a way that the, the trees are very uh, forbidding and exclude, exclude the herbivores from getting in and packing the snow. And that means that the temperature of the cold of the winter is not transmitted well. Anyway, this, this is something that we've been asked uh, or we've weighed in on since 2006, but we really didn't have any funding to do this until just two months ago. Uh, nevertheless, we have a lot of results that I'll show you uh, that, that are based on adjacent projects and are relevant to human health. Um, and in one recent, uh, very recent 
uh, article that even went so far to imply that this might be something that would help relationships, foreign relationships. Um, this is Foreign Policy magazine. So what's happening is, uh, I say 30 fold here, it's, it's 30 to 80, depending on how you do the time uh, measurement. But uh, anyway, car uh, methane is much worse than, than uh, carbon dioxide. And we're seeing uh, methane uh, in the lakes, uh, on the land, away from the lakes. There's, there's uh, so many uh, bodies of water, fresh water in uh, the Arctic. And, uh, and, and they will spontaneously blow up uh, these big holes in the ground uh, from methane explosion. That typically you only find by flying over because there's hardly any people here. And then this is uh, uh, Nikita and Sergei Zemov demonstrating that you can light the, 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 the lakes on fire um, because of the methane there. So there's a lot of methane. This is a map of all the places where there's a lot of carbon. There's more carbon in the Arctic than there is in any of the rainforests. And that's because each year you get a new layer that freezes. So it's great at sequestering. It's inactive from that point on, but they keep, you keep layering carbon on top uh, due to um, uh, the activity of the herbivores and, and the grass that keeps growing on top. So it's, so it's sometimes 500 times thicker in the Arctic uh, carbon than the uh, tropical rainforests. And this is a map where red, red orange is uh, the deeper deposits. And then this is a population map. So we're, we're aiming for. Uh, putting these uh, Arctic elephants in regions of low population, low human population, but high carbon uh, at risk. So the extinction or the, the endangerment of uh, modern elephants is due to, we think mainly to two things. One is they're in region, they're, they tend to be in regions of high human population. So they're in conflict with the farmers and the poachers. And they also in conflict with a, a particular herpes virus that is uh, quite lethal to newborns. Uh, about 25% of them are dying. And so we're working with Paul Ling and others to, to um, come up with strategies, either immune strategies or uh, CRISPR nuclease-based strategies for eliminating these viruses, uh, uh, which would probably be uh, might well have been um, attack uh, mammoths because uh, mammoths and Asian elephants are more closely related than, than African elephants, and even African elephants were attacked by this herpes virus. And the, and the world has a lot of experience with rewilding. You hear about cases that didn't work out so well, like the foxes in Yellowstone, uh, sorry, the, the wolves in Yellowstone, which, which did work out well the second time when we restored them cane toes and so forth, but there, there are literally thousands of examples um, in, in North America and the world. And, and some of the, 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 the uh, methods that have been used, for example, for the condor, California condor is using hand puppets uh, and so on. Bison have gone from about 500 bison to uh, 500,000 worldwide. So that's... Uh, that's some of the reasons why we're doing this project. Uh, now let's uh, talk about exactly what it is we're doing. We've uh, sequenced uh, somewhere between 18 and 20 uh, different elephant uh, genomes here represented the, the, the three endangered species and one extinct uh, species and many examples of each. And uh, in parentheses are the quality, the, the coverage of the, of the sequencing, and it, get, it gets better and better. And we've picked over a thousand variants, which are fixed in the mammoths, meaning they're homozygous in the mammoths, and that allele, that variation is not found in any of the modern elephants. So it's um, dramatic um, fixation in a fairly short period of time. And then we've designed, um, don't worry about the jargon just yet, we'll get to it, but. A base editors, these are things that will take adenines and turn them into guanines in specific positions programmed by CRISPR or, or other enzyme, uh, other DNA protein interaction. Or C base editors, which will go from C to T. 
fairly precisely. And then the alternative, the more general method is homologous uh, uh, combination or a primer editor or um, a rec ET. These are three methods of getting larger uh, regions of substitution rather than point mutations. And there's some annotation of fold adapted genes and we've, we've focused a little bit of our priority on that. So uh, one phenotype of significance, uh, some, some people want incredibly tiny elephants and there, there are some that are as little as 0.3 tons, uh, 300 kilograms. And then there were the record, I think for any land uh, animal ever is the uh, paleodot paleodoxin, and, and that is uh, 22 tons, and mammoths is somewhere in between. Um, but we, in principle, we can use the diversity in size for different ecosystems. Um, they also uh, wide variation in the, in the wild for tusk length, um, ranging from almost undetectable tusks uh, in some, especially in herds that are subject to poaching of, for the tusks. Uh, the poachers leave along the uh, animals that don't have tusks. And then this, this particular tribe of elephants uh, alive today uh, has exceptionally long tusks um, uh, common in the, in the, in the tribe. Um, and so we might want to have both uh, the, the long mammoth tusks and the, and the sh short ones, depending on whether they're um, properly supervised and cared for. Another feature that varies a bit uh, among modern elephants is, that, is how much they like the snow. So the Asian elephants being closer to the mammoths seem to like the snow. Here's some in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, in Ontario, Canada, and in Sweden. Um, and they like, they'll play in the snow, they'll build these big snowballs and they will break through the ice and um, um, swim in, in, the, in the winter. And then here's, here's me with Mike, uh, a five-year-old who eventually got um, herpes virus and died. And here's a 50-year-old Emily um, in Massachusetts. And here's some examples of, of, of de-extinction of genes, not of species. Our goal is not to de-extinct species, but to enrich the diversity of, of uh, endangered existing species. And here's... Uh, uh, progress from uh, the Campbell lab uh, showing that the mammoth hemoglobin recreated, um, restored, de extincted, whatever you want to call it, is indeed uh, has um, cold um, tolerance properties um, when, you, when you study the hemoglobin saturation, the function of oxygen pressure. Uh, there's, there's these very distinctive physiological effects. And it's a very small number of amino acids here. You can see in blue and red are the substitutions that, differ, that separate African and Asian and mammoth elephants, these three species from one another. And uh, it, it's uh, uh, maybe not everybody is familiar with the fact that uh, the, these ele elephants in general like knocking down trees. One could imagine genetically engineering them and or training them to like it even more but uh, these, are, these are much larger trees than you typically find in the Arctic. It, it, it takes 50 years to even get a few centimeters uh, diameter in the Arctic of uh, these elephants. Just, uh, it's not even clear there's any food at the top of this tree, uh, just knocking it down. Uh, hair is another um, thing that's very significantly different between the African, Asian, and, and uh, mammoth. Um, and, and there's plenty of, of genes. It's, this is a very well understood in a variety of animals, including humans. Here's, here's a human polymorphism, a simple uh, point mutation that, uh, that can run in families uh, as, a, as a dominant allele. Uh, ear size is important. Uh, in Africa, they need big ears to radiate heat and the mammoth needed very small ears uh, uh, in order to not get frostbite. Um, and the final example is uh, our, the, the, the nerves uh, have receptors that they're sensitive to heat uh, over this large range from, um, you know, close to freezing uh, up to uh, quite 
quite high temperatures. And these have been, uh, in trip V3 has been engineered to show that it is, um, uh, has, has a, an effect that might be consistent with um, a, you know, a lowering in sensitivity uh, uh, at, at the high at temp temperatures that would be appropriate or inappropriate for the mammal. So how are we doing this? Um, we have a variety of uh, genome engineering tools which are sometimes lumped together. Uh, I, I will separate them out into, into four categories, which is kind of rough editing, which is addition and subtraction. CRISPR is particularly good at subtraction, removing functionality of a gene. There's precise editing, which can be done in a variety of ways that I've alluded to, base editing, for example. And there's epigenetic, where you don't change the DNA, but you change the way that it's regulated. Um, I, I'm going to particularly note the deaminases. I've already noted them, that this goes from A to G or C to T, in particular A to G. Um, and here's some of the companies that have been involved in this revolution in, in altering our, our uh, nucleic acids in, in cells of plants and animals. Now, the record that I know of for an engineered animal number of edits that we needed to make in order to make these animals sufficiently tolerated by uh, their organs, tolerated by a, a primate or human recipient was about 42. This number might eventually change, but this seems to be every, everybody's wish list in the field has been working on this for over 20 years. Um, uh, three of them involve sugars, a few are involved in the clotting cascade or the complement to blood cascades of proteases. Um, the major histocompatibility, which is a classic way that you match two humans for their um, organ donor recipient and various other immune functions. And most significantly, I think, is that the FDA was not comfortable with the fact that every cell of every pig produces uh, an endogenous retrovirus. And so that in an immune suppressed uh, organ recipient as is kind of standard in transplantation would be a, a unfortunately good incubator for uh, a zoonotic disease. And we really don't want to have another Ebola swine flu or coronavirus uh, incident due to evolution of a, of a zoonotic disease. So we eliminated all of the endogenous retroviruses which is ranges from about 20 to 80, depending on the strain of pigs. And we've done this in multiple strains of pigs showing it's, it's general and the, the viruses don't come back. Even though, even if the embryo passes through a surrogate um, pig mother that's full of the virus, the embryo is not, is resistant to reinfection for reasons that we think we understand uh, having to do with the envelope of the endogenous retrovirus. We didn't completely eliminate the retrovirus. We just got rid of the polymerase gene, so it isn't, it can't actively spread. And these are now in preclinical trials. Uh, uh, the organs are being transplanted, three, three different organ types in three different hospitals um, in the United States. Jim Martin is leading the, the original surgical team at MDH. And these are three papers describing the construction and, and testing of these um, synthetic uh, biology pigs. Lu Han Yang was the, was the key mover and she, behind this. She was a graduate student postdoc in my lab, and we co founded these two companies, Kihan and Eugenesis, um, where she's CEO of Kihan. And this is uh, in order to do this, to do that many changes at once. You know, for, for example, the retroviruses. We, we, do them all at once. Um, uh, if you make that many edits, if you try to make that number of uh, CRISPR edits at once, you get none that are multiply edited. You get totally insufficient amount of multiplex editing um, as shown on, on the left here. Uh, none are, are more than 40% edited. Um, while if, if we use two, and, and these two are synergistic, two strategies. One is a macromolecule basic fibroblast growth factor and the other is a small molecule, P53 inhibitor. Now almost everything is the, uh, is the correct um, edit, multiplex editing 
get edited and we would, we would then clonally expand those and turn those into uh, piglets. Now, we, the, most of the pig work has been done in vivo in a surrogate pig mother, but there is some progress, for example, this group, this group at the Weissman Institute in getting um, mammals to develop outside of the body in a, in a machine. Uh, unfortunately, these are not um, really capable of maturing because there's no good interface for the umbilical cord as there would normally be via a placental uterine interaction. So we're trying to get this to go beyond sort of um, almost halfway through uh, develop, development in the mouse. And we could also rescue premature uh, fetuses from about halfway through for, for the human. So we're trying to get these to match in the middle. Um, we, we, uh, I'll show you some of the progress we've made towards being able to engineer tissues that would allow um, development. So we're, we and others are engineering uh, human uh, development from stem cells to gametes, egg and sperm. And we're also working on various vascularized tissues, meaning tissues that have uh, blood vessels in them so that they can, only if you have blood vessels can your tissues get more than say a half a millimeter without getting necrotic and dying. So it, we're particularly, we're interested in vascularized endometrium where the embryo can implant and grow. So uh, what we're doing is there's kind of, again, this dance between reading and writing. There's an effort worldwide to, to read in uh, the, the RNA transcriptomes for every kind of cell type present in humans and mice. And these are called cell atlases or cell landscapes. And there's, you know, on the order of hundreds, maybe here's 843 different cell types, um, probably more, probably depends on how you divide it. But the point is we want to have a recipe for making cheese. We're not only going to read out all the seven different cell types, we want to be able to make them as well. And uh, Alex and Tara Stu have, have uh, did this as postdocs in my lab, um, harnessing um, 1,700 human open reading frames that look like they either are known to be transcription factors or look like they could be anything that could be. And many of these are we synthesized from scratch so they would have the right codon usage, et cetera. And then here's an example of three different tissue types um, for endothelial cells, um, um, for, for neurons and, and fibroblasts. And, and this is kind of an expression readout showing that we're getting multiple uh, bits of evidence that, that these are what we think they are. At, at the RNA level and at the protein function level, we have, for example, observed action potentials, um, multiple action potentials in, uh, in the neurons derived. So we have 290 different cell recipes um, and, we're, and we're particularly interested in the ones in the brain and the reproductive system. So here's an example where we made three different cell types in the brain that's involved in the, the myelin sheets that, that makes uh, conductance of action potentials very fast in the, in the um, uh, white matter of your brain or in the spinal column. Um, and if you have a demyelinating disease, you lose this myelin, but here, in vitro, completely synthetic biology, we can wrap an axon of a neuron with just the right number of wraps of the myelin to simulate this. And, and not only does it look good, it, it uh, functions in vivo. We can rescue a mouse that has a demyelinating disease, um, similar to multiple sclerosis. And we can rescue it by implanting a human organoid that is composed of these three cell types, the endothelium, uh, which gets filled with an so the human capillary gets filled with mouse blood and then the, the neurons and the myelinating action of the ligand endocytes. So, the, so Alex and, and Paris Duke have gone on to, to try to take this and other um, tissue therapies into the clinic uh, through GC Therapeutics and we've um, studied for this. And, and in these goals of whether we're deriving the organs from human stem cells in the last example or in, or in germline engineered pigs, we, we're not just looking for organs 
for the transplantation crisis, we also want to have them enhanced that they are particularly resistant to pathogens, to senescence, to cancer, um, to immune uh, rejection, and even cryopreservation and DNA damage. All of these things have been demonstrated in animals, and now we have to do the hard work of translating them into something that would be clinically safe and effective. Now, I mentioned we want to do very high levels of multiplex editing in order to achieve things like um, adaptation of uh, endangered species to the modern world or increasing the diversity. There's a lot of parts of the DNR that are involved in diversity. So our record right now for um, editing genomes is um, about 24,000 edits in a single cell of a human pluripotent stem cell that comes from the Personal Genome Project. And here we're using an editor which historically would um, was not specific for any of these three Cs. We only wanted to do this one C to, that would convert from a CAG codon to a TAG stop codon. I'm making a stop codon here. Um, but, but you get editing of all uh, three Cs into Ts, um, but that's, that might, it doesn't matter that you, you got the disruption. The, the disruption will be the main uh, phenotype. Um, and this was done by Raphael, Corey, Oscar, and Verena, where we got 64% um, editing, 24,000 edits at once. And we're going to keep pushing it higher and higher uh, with some other families. This required all the non nicking strategies I described and more. You can't even have repair processes that might. Uh, release a, a nick. Now that's that was all done. That that record was set by editing the line elements. These are long interspersed repeats now throughout the genome of many vertebrates, um, and we specifically targeted or two of that. Um, but if we wanted to generalize that a bit, uh, we would like to be able to knock out elements, uh, gen, uh, genes. Or, 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 not, or, or alter them without knocking them out, uh, precise editing. We'd, we'd, we'd like to be able to do that with um, not uh, unique sequences, non repetitive. And, uh, and so this is our progress in doing this. We've knocked out simultaneously in one transfection 33 essential uh, uh, genes, not, not knocked out. We've edited them in a way that should be benign, uh, synonymous change in the stop codon. Um, and we've successfully done that for 33 genes, but we'd like to push that up into the tens of thousands of genes. And, and as another example, in addition to the extinction and, and also adaptation of uh, pig cells so that they're immune compatible with the human organ recipient, a third example of why you would want multiplex editing is making changes to genetic code so you can now incorporate new new chemistry for non-standard amino acids. You can do biocontainment so that things don't get out and you can make multivirus resistance. I very I think it's a very profound idea that you can make an organism completely resistant to all viruses, including viruses you've never seen before. Uh, and, and this work of doing this in an industrial microorganism, E. coli, has been captured in these various um, papers from science and nature mostly since 2009 to 2020. And this is just showing the codon table that we're altering uh, the big numbers uh, for each codon, each of the 64 triplet codons is the number of times it's used in the E. coli genome. And in, in red is the first one we changed. We changed this, we tested it. It's useful, it's, it's being used in a couple of companies. Um, so that's, and, and it is multivirus resistant. So as I'll show you in just a moment. Um, that has been added to two more codons by the Chen, Jason Chen's lab and three more codons uh, by, by our lab. But still the original strain with just the one codon altered is quite, quite interesting. Um, and we're trying to reproduce the same thing now in mammals and plants. So here's the data from the virus. This is, uh, Farron Isaacs was a postdoctoral fellow that helped initiate this project in my lab. And now he's a tenured faculty at Yale and uh, his student, Natalie Ma, um, sh showed that, uh, that 
you, you could get incredible reduction in virus, a loss of infectivity to the cells um, because the cells are missing uh, normally re required release factor. They, we've changed all the UAGs to UAAs and, and then that allows us to um, remove the, the release factor. And that's what the dark um, black bars are. And you can just see um, uh, all the zeros with star asterisks over the asterisk, four asterisks mean very statistically significant. All of those strains of viruses um, are not capable of infecting, even if you put them up in incredibly high concentrations like 10 to the 10th or 10 to the 12th per milliliter. The, the, the two types of viruses that escape are viruses that don't happen to use the UAG in an essential way in an essential gene. But we have a very clear path for fixing that by looking at transfer RNAs as well as um, top So this is work of Akkoch and Anoush and their team. And I just want to kind of wrap it up, uh, um, open it up for questions, thanking some of the people that were involved in the mammalian genome engineering. This is not just for uh, elephants, this is uh, mouse and human as well. Ariona Yuting, Stephen Casper wrote the software, awesome software, Richie Coleman. And for Vive and Restore, I haven't mentioned this too much, but it's, it's uh, a lot of the brains behind uh, the push to apply modern molecular biology tools to more um, perennial problems like um, carbon sequestration, um, keystone species, uh, endangered species, and so on. So we're very grateful for that as well.